Good afternoon. And firstly, I'm, I'm keenly aware that this is the last session of the day of, a, of two terrific days. And as we launch into this last session, let me, on behalf of everyone here, say thank you to Ali Soufan and the, the entire team at Soufan Center, along with their partners, for putting on a pretty terrific day, uh, or two days, of events. It's been a remarkable event. Um, it's assembled an incredibly impressive array of experts to talk about one of the really challenging security issues of our time. Now, the misuse of information, as we, vividly, as we vividly have seen yesterday and today, leads to unnecessary conflict between states, and we certainly see that in this region. And the weaponization of information also distorts and disrupts our politics. And those politics that are disrupted are both national politics, but also international politics and global politics. And weaponized information, perhaps worst of all, threatens to tear apart our social fabric. And certainly in America, that feels true right now. At home, it feels, to me, like a moment of genuine crisis and peril largely tied to this threat. And I'm sure under nation, other nations represented at this event feel that threat as well. And so that's why this last panel is such a fascinating and fitting note on which to conclude this year's Global Security Forum. Information is most certainly a weapon. But unlike bombs and unlike bullets, information is a weapon that is most often used asymmetrically. And its use as a weapon of asymmetric warfare creates genuine response and policy dilemmas for, for governments. It's much easier for governments to know how to respond when they are attacked using conventional weapons of war. And as someone who worked inside our US government for most of the last 18 years focused on terrorism and counterterrorism, I watched the United States, our system, expand our toolkit for fighting terror over those years. And that required investments in many things. It required investments in weapons, it required investments in other technologies, but it also required new policy and legal frameworks. And the work of expanding and refining that set of counterterrorism capabilities, what I call our toolkit, that continues today, even with my governments, with my successors in government, they are always working to expand that toolkit. So this last panel today will tackle the difficult but essential task of developing policy responses to meet this challenge of disinformation that we've heard so much about yesterday and today. And the panel we've assembled, assembled today is just the right one to stimulate new thinking and new ideas on this set of issues. The set of experts you will be hearing from includes officials who are grappling with these problems right now, even as we sit here in Doha. And it also includes prominent voices from academia who are, who are working to study these issues. The panel will provide, of course, an American perspective, because a couple of the panelists are American. But equally importantly, the panel will reflect the views and experiences of European states dealing with these same threatening issues, in this case, Estonia and Sweden. And lastly, before I stop with the framing and let you actually have the panel, a word about our moderator this afternoon. Karen Greenberg leads the Center on National Security at Fordham University's School of Law. But in my mind, she's much more than that. Her voice on critical questions of national security, law, civil liberties, has been one of the most important and informed voices and influential voices in America in the period since 9-11 and continues to be so. She's widely published on matters of law and security, and she continues to serve as a thought leader and an expert resource to all of us concerned with these important national security issues. So with that, I will ask Karen to join on stage and welcome the rest of our panel. I want to thank all of you for hanging in here to the, what is the last panel, um, which is a big burden because we feel like we have to wrap up everything for you, but don't worry. This panel will not disappoint. Uh, and I also want to thank the Soufan Center for uh, such a wonderful job over the last uh, two days. Uh, I think it's been a very important conference, and I think we've all learned a lot. So let me begin by introducing the panel and then getting to the substance of our discussion. Um, we're going to begin with Charles Spencer. Charles most recently was the SA Special Agent in Charge in Jacksonville. Before that, he was the Deputy Director working on WMD issues in, for the FBI. Um, but most of his career has included issues related to counterterrorism. He's been involved in some of the most important domestic terrorism 
um, investigations from Oklahoma to the embassy bombings to the more recent period of post 9-11. Um, and so, but he is also an engineer by training and an expert in cyber issues. So we should have a lot to learn from you. But before you speak, let me introduce the rest of the panel. Um, Keith uh, Pentis Rosimanis is a member of the Estonian parliament. Before that, she was Minister of Foreign Affairs. She, she is also was Minister of the Environment. She now currently serves as a member of parliament on the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, and you know, Estonia, which we're gonna get to, is one of the countries that has the longest standing um, experience, I guess is the way to say it, with disinformation. Um, and its effect um, on politics, on electoral politics, and many other things. So we will come back to you. Um, then I want to turn to Michael Torfesen, who is uh, from Sweden. He is the head of the Global Monitoring and Analysis section at the MSB. The MSB is the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency, and that's a lot of words for saying that he organizes and oversees the across government, the um, cyber disinformation and other related cyber threats and how to respond to them. And we, I am very much looking forward to his remarks. And then finally, Jason Blazakis, who is Professor of Practice at the Center on Terrorism, Counterterrorism, and Extremism at the Middlebury Institute um, at, in Monterey. So um, I think we better get started. So I want to start with Charles. And Charles, I want to, one of the things, we've all talked ahead of time, and one of the things that you've talked about that others have talked about earlier in the conference, but that you, um, I think, spoke to in, in a very uh, in interesting way to me, is what you think the, the stakes are. We, we know from two days that, we've ha that there's compromised issues that we're worried about um, attacks both on um, the, the framework, the hardware, the software, but, uh, and the disinformation space. But you also have a sense of what the larger stakes are, and Nick began by talking about the politics that are affected by this, the political framework. Can you talk a little bit to what you think the stakes are? Sure, Karen. Sure, Karen. I'd, uh, I'd like to. So first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Safan Group and the Qatari people for their warm welcome here. Uh, this is my first visit to uh, to Doha and to Qatar, and this will not be my last. So I'm very very welcomed by the people here. So thank you very much. Um, so I do have a little experience working this problem uh, as a special agent in charge in the north half of Florida uh, during the 2016 election. I dealt with the uh, issues with the Russian hacking, the attempted hacking, and the malign influence that uh, that we received in the state of Florida. So I I did have quite a bit of exposure to it. And and to me, the overarching uh, issue we have, and I've heard it explained here many different ways, and I think it has been captured as uh, weaponry and warfare. This is a warfare, malign influence, or as we call it, foreign influence in the FBI, is a type of warfare against the sovereignty of a nation. It's a type of warfare against uh, countries that value democracy, countries that value the vote. Um, you know, the FBI, our, our core mission, as we always say, is, is to, you know, uphold the Constitution, and protect the public. Well, in, in my current job as Assistant Director of International Operations Division, I, lead, I have 90 offices around the world that work with countries all over the world. And what we do is we try and help our other services and our other friends and our other partners do the exact thing, protect their country and protect their public because the world is very small today. Uh, as I always like to say, the world, uh, criminals, terrorists, foreign, malign foreign powers don't care about a line in a map. The people that they are attacking today may be my citizens today and your citizens in Estonia this afternoon because the world is so small. So we want to work together. But the real threat to me is the pillars that uphold any, and I use the term democracy, but any real sovereign nation, any democracy, especially the two pillars, are trust in your public officials, you have to have that, and trust in your vote. And these malign actors are trying to erode the trust in the dem uh, democratic voting process. And I think that is a, uh, an existential threat that is a th core threat to America. It is a core threat to all free countries that you do this. And, and I think, you know, warfare is essentially what this is. If you look 100, 100 years ago, if you'd have said a foreign actor is going to come into country and attempt to influence your election, there could have been a de declaration of war. But because of inf information technology today, the way we look at things, we, 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 the way we view the world, you know, as a uh, inter intertwined uh, economic environment, we can't respond that way. Um, 
And I think one of the ways the FBI has taken a stance to respond to this is, and that applies to almost all of our partner nations here, is as a result of our learning experience, and we learned the hard way that the chaos can be created by a small number of actors, which we did indict 13 Russian actors as a result of the 2016, uh, their attempted uh, influence in our election, is to create a foreign, in foreign influence task force, we call it our FIDF. And what we do with that is we work operations, we do outreach, and we do sharing. And we spend a lot of time sharing with our partner nations so that they can harden themselves against any future attempts. And we get information from our partners as well about what they've experienced and try and make ourselves better to try and push that information out so that basically all the free nations of the world can have a stronger defenses and share information in real time about what they are experiencing. Um, we're going to come back to that um, international governance, international awareness. But Keith, I, I want to talk to you um, about what you've learned, sort of best lessons since for over a decade, Estonia has been the target, at least that they've known about, has been the target of Russian attempts to interfere through disinformation and other ways in Estonian uh, political affairs, Estonian elections. Um, you've had some time to think about it, to work on policies. What are the, what are the takeaways? What are the, the best practices and the best lessons? Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I would also like to start with thanking uh, uh, this forum for uh, really thoughts uh, provoking um, exchange of uh, ideas during the last uh, two, two days. It has, has been really useful also for me, coming from Estonia. Um, what I've also realized is that uh, it still happens uh, that sometimes we tend to um, mix things up a little. When we talk about disinformation, uh, it quite often becomes to mixed up with uh, cyber as well. And uh, while two of those fields uh, definitely are big problems, they are still different uh, fields. Um, and also, uh, I think when it comes to the disinformation, it's not always um, alarming thing. Uh, when it comes alarming uh, for Estonia, for example, is that uh, once it is um, organized, um, by a foreign state, and uh, once it is targeted against our own sovereign state. And it's pretty similar thing with the cyber. I mean, uh, we do see hundreds and thousands of uh, minor cyber incidents during a day. I think it's everywhere the same, and yet not all of them are uh, alarming in the same um, extent. When uh, they do become alarming is that once they do attack uh, the critical infrastructure, of course, um, and uh, once it is um, reasonable to presume that the cyber attack um, may end with the loss of lives or with the serious damage of an object or an infrastructure. And uh, those two, the disinformation and cyber attacks, uh, I mean, it is very possible that uh, something that starts as a disinformation operation evolves and becomes also a cyber attack. Um, it's not always so. Still, what is the same with the two of those is the goal. And the, the goal, both uh, uh, for a cyber attack and for this information operation um, coming from a different uh, country is to uh, create tensions, to harm um, another country. And this is uh, why I very much agree uh, with what you said previously, that it has to be understood that this is not some kind of, um, we still call it meddling. What does it mean, meddling? It's an attack. It's basically a warfare. And this is, uh, I think it's, it's very important distinction uh, to understand and, and it's the distinction to be made. Um, when it comes to the Estonian uh, lesson, uh, then um, uh, I would start saying that um, in 2007, uh, we were quite lucky to become the first uh, country that was um, attacked um, using the cyber means and disinformation um, uh, tactics by Russia. 
And uh, why I say that uh, we were lucky is that uh, we have um, been able to develop uh, the, the cyber defense and also the disinformation defense as one of our biggest strengths, I would say, currently. And what we have learned is that um, uh, a country can be successful uh, in, uh, in that defense field only if the whole society is engaged, basically. It cannot be only a government's business. Uh, it was our lesson that we had to engage uh, the private sector as well as the NGOs um, and also uh, the media uh, was an um, important part in uh, deterring and, and in fighting that um, huge uh, campaign. And um, another part of the uh, lesson that we for sure can elaborate a bit more later is that uh, you cannot really play soft if your adversary uh, does not play soft. Um, I must say that um, the fact that we have not been really eager to respond uh, internationally to those um, attacks uh, we have uh, witnessed during the last couple of years, um, I think that it has been taken as a signal that um, those who use those attacks can proceed. Um, so I would definitely say that uh, the need for a, a wider international response um, and the need uh, to show that we take those attacks seriously is definitely there. Michael, um, I saw you nodding your head to a, to a, <laughs> to a lot of what Kate said. Um, and I'm curious how you think about the last point that she brought up about the need to respond, what happens if you aren't aggressive in your response. Um, I know that Sweden's had its own engagement with the issue of disinformation as well as cyber attacks. And um, stepping back, though, from the point of view of how a democracy responds, um, with the idea that you want to be aggressive, um, but you also want to be a democracy. How have you thought about this in your line of business? Yeah, uh, and thank you for being here and the hospitality uh, that has been shown to us. Uh, I nodded a lot because I agree, uh, but I'll first say when it comes to response also that uh, I'm not so sure we should talk about war because war is actually might be deceiving you. Uh, what we're talking about here when it comes to disinformation and propaganda uh, and those kinds of activities is that most of it is legal and most of it is okay. Uh, the, the well, now I'm back. Uh, the problem is uh, when you put a, a lot of activities together, they have uh, negative consequences. And the aggressor, they're trying to keep their activities on a level so we can't respond in an aggressive way. So f therefore, in Sweden, we framed it, uh, the, the problem here as information influence activities. And uh, I'm responsible at our agency for the work with identifying and countering these activities. And what is that for us? It's when you use information, uh, even correct information, in a malign, with a malign intent in a deceptive way so it will have negative effects on our national security objectives. For instance, if you spread information that will threaten the safety and security of our population, the functionality of our society, or uh, our fundamental values, freedom of speech, individual rights, and so on. Uh, to, to be very clear what, I could, what this could be, for instance, targeting, <coughs> sorry, uh, functionality, spreading rumors that uh, your uh, credit card, if you use it, you'll uh, lose your money. That will have a physical effect, actually, because if you can't use your credit card, you can't access food, you can't access fuel, and a lot of other things. You can actually have uh, a physical consequence with uh, only words. So that's the way we go about it and, and look at it. Uh, and, and therefore, also, uh, we see it this way, coming back to your question. We need to be proportionate and firm, but we can't wage war on someone spreading rumors, so, so we can't bomb the aggressor. Well, Sweden wouldn't do it anyway. We're a small country. Uh, but we need actually to look at our toolbox to see uh, uh, 
what is proportionate uh, regarding this. And uh, uh, also then understanding, to, to be able to do this, uh, if, if an aggressor is using legal tools to attack you, but when you put them together, they will have severe consequences. Well, you need to understand consequences, what they mean to your country. So therefore, when we took a look at these uh, activities, we look at the consequences, and we realized also that the reason why these things are working is that uh, we're vulnerable to certain things. And we looked at different countries and the US election, asking ourselves, why did it work in 2016? And we realized that countries uh, that have been targeted and where an influence campaign has been effective are countries which were lacking awareness about the threat, that there is a threat, and awareness about their own vulnerabilities. What is it that will be effective in your country? Uh, but it's not enough with that. You also actually have to have an all, uh, good cooperation and communication. For instance, uh, elections in Sweden and most countries are conducted on a municipality level. A municipality being attacked by a foreign state actor, an intelligence organization, uh, uh, foreign state directed media, they're not going to stand a chance. But if they do this in our country, we see it, and we put our resources together, because they're targeting, targeting our vulnerabilities, suddenly we're the strong part here, and then we can counteract. So therefore, uh, awareness about the threat, and vulnerabilities, and cooperation, coordination, and then a response that is actually within uh, the framework of our democratic system. It has to be within the framework of your own legal system. Um, so following on from that, Jason, um, one of the actors in the United States and elsewhere in terms of um, awareness, analysis, and response is the private sector. And so can you talk to us a little bit? I know you're going to do a little bit of a slideshow, correct? That's right. Um, and just talk to us a little bit about the, re the, the public-private response and, and how that factors in, in your vision of where we're headed. All right. Thank you. And first, thank you to the Sufan Center for organizing the event. Um, as well, thank you to the government of Qatar for hosting this event. Um, it's been a fantastic event, it's two days of um, information regarding disinformation. I'm going to have a very short PowerPoint, just 40 slides. That was a joke. Um, and I, a couple of you did laugh. So um, it's four slides. Um, so I fed you some disinformation. And I think we live in the time um, of the industrialization of terrorist propaganda. I think we're, we're near that time for a couple reasons. Um, I think um, one reason is the proliferation of artificial intelligence tools, um, primarily created by the private sector. And one tool that I've heard one reference to um, perhaps two, um, our colleagues from the Global Engagement Center referenced something called neural net powered language models. And we talked a lot about deep fakes, but this is an area that the center I work at is studying because I think it's going to have a profound effect on terrorist ability to push out propaganda. So we're calling the program that we're looking at Interpro. And this team that we've developed, um, we have terrorism, scholars, we have individuals who are linguists, we have data scientists, computer scientists as part of this program to essentially explore how bad actors, non-state and state actors can use these tools, much of which um, have been made publicly available. I think, again, it was the Global Engagement Center that said um, some of these tools are available. We are testing tools that aren't available um, to the public at this point in time, but they soon could be available. Uh, we're working directly with open uh, AI, an organization based in San Francisco, and then Allen AI to test these, what I'll call language model tools. And the effects, I think, will be profound. And what we're doing is we're taking the algorithms developed by these organizations and tweaking them um, by adding new material, ingesting new material in four different lines. Um, those four lines are essentially putting material into the language model that may be manifestos, say, from, for instance, Salafi jihadist groups, um, manifestos from left-wing or Marxist-Leninist organizations, anarchist organizations, and then far-right organizations, and how these models could churn out synthetic language 
that could be perceived to be authentic or human in orientation. So I have um, a slide here that is an output from the model that we tweaked um, that was ingested essentially information from various manifestos of individuals who carried out acts of terrorism on the far right side of the spectrum to include individuals like the individual who carried out the attack in Oslo, Norway, um, Dylan Roof who carried out the attack in South Carolina, the Poway shooter, amongst others. And I, I think if you take a time to, to read this, um, I, I think you would understand the power of this tool. Um, I, I think there was a mention yesterday um, of the tools not being quite ready for prime time to be used by bad actors. But I think we're at this point, if these tools are made publicly available, that could have a profound effect in the propagation of messaging by bad actors. And I say that for a couple reasons. In the last slide, we took the GPT tool um, that we got from OpenAI and then used Allen AI's synthetic AI detector to determine whether or not the synthetic text that we developed could be identified by AI tools. And if you look at this slide, um, the fake text that we generated more often than not was identified as being human in orientation as opposed to synthetic in orientation. And, and because of that, I think we're living in a moment where um, terrorist groups and other state actors, for instance, may be able to take these tools to create and propagate messages in a way that's perceived to be authentic by human audiences at a scale in which um, we're not really equipped to deal with. And I, I think it's going to be incumbent upon, um, I, I, I know we use the term public-private partnerships, and I'll get back to this probably in the next question, but I think it's going to be incumbent upon consumers and companies to work together um, to identify ways to actually combat the propagation of tools like this that could be used by illicit actors. And I, I say just one specific example of why this could be important in the terrorism context. If you think about organizations who have pushed forward propaganda, organizations like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, having individuals like Samir Khan who created the Aspire magazine by AQAP, obviously an individual that was recently announced to be taken off the battlefield, um, replacing an individual like him is very difficult. Um, and you've seen that because of his removal from the battlefield, the organization hasn't been as productive in proliferating its message. But what if organizations could use these public available tools? Um, they could replace the Samir Khans of the world in a much more easy fashion. So it's this, for this reason, I think we have to talk seriously about the implications from um, a legal policy and regulatory viewpoint to try to counter the proliferation of technology like this. Kate, did you want to weigh in on the war versus non war versus crime way of yes, looking and, at this? Yes, uh, and I believe even start from a little bit further uh, because um, very often uh, the first thing that comes still to our mind when talking about the disinformation um, and the technological uh, means for that is still the last U.S. Uh, presidential elections. I think what is um, important um, for all the countries to realize is that the um, influencing does not start with the start of the election campaign. It's ongoing. Uh, in Estonia, for example, we have the elections, parliamentary elections, uh, always the first um, Sunday of uh, March, every four years. And the influencing, the next elections, starts on the first or the second Monday following the elections. So it's, uh, it's not enough if we start to think about it uh, once the official campaign period is launched. So that was just one remark, but also about the proportionality of the response. I very much agree uh, with uh, what Mikael said, that uh, the response needs to be proportional. Uh, it does not mean that if there is a serious uh, cyber attack that really causes um, uh, the loss of human lives that we need to use um, bombs, so to say. But we have to be ready to respond Proportionally, proportional uh, response does not to be uh, kinetic or conventional, but the readiness to response, uh, respond, um, the, the 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 mental readiness, uh, the psychological readiness, the technical readiness. I think it is still a really crucial thing um, to have. And uh, just to um, share one more uh, principle uh, of Estonia uh, when it comes to the. Um, uh, malign uh, uh, spread of the uh, disinformation, but also cyber 
uh, attacks is that the same rules that apply in um, real world or the analog world, the same rules apply also in um, digital world. So there are very often, uh, uh, you know, long and long debates whether we should uh, impose the new regulations, uh, new, lo new laws, whether we should start the whole new debate over the regulations in digital work world. Why should we? We have the rules that regulate, starting from hate speech to um, um, threatening somebody's lives, um, that are in are already in effect in real world. The same rules should apply also to the same acts uh, in digital world. Yeah, and I think that's a really a missed point in a lot of conversations about this is that we may be in a new world in terms of the uh, capacities that the internet and the cyber realm provide, but the answers are still the basic answers of security protection and how we want to balance those things. Which brings me back to you, Charles, which is the real question of how, how first of all, we're getting to the topic of our panel, which is sort of buried there, which is, you know, um, can we build on existing legislation um, as a way of using it to counter cyber and disinformation attacks? Do we need new legislation? Um, and then um, I'm going to turn to you for the international covenants and sort of talk about international governance. But just domestically in the United States, the way we think about that, is there a need for more legislation or not? Well, the question would be uh, domestically in the United States, is there a need for more legislation? Uh, the FBI enforces laws more so than rights them, but you know, it's a new world. There's lots of new rules. You can interpret many of the existing laws to cover the violations that are being encountered. The big problem we have is in the, on the international front is that it's very hard to uh, go after someone if you can identify them, if you can figure out where they're at, and if they're in a country that, that is a malign actor, that's uh, you know, China, Russia, and Ir China, Russia, Iran. I mean, those are your top three. We can indict them, but we're probably, you know, the chances of getting them back are very slim. We're always going to keep trying. The FBI never forgets. And we will keep, we will do our best so to, to get them. But, you know, it's a question of, uh, when you talk about legislation in the United States, we have existing legislation. Now, does it really help on the malign influence? Well, if we can identify someone doing it in the United States, it does. But typically, it is so, by the time we do any legal process, by the time we do our investigation, uh, it is very helpful to potentially uh, influence people from not doing it in the future, but the damage is typically done by the time we do it. The cyber investigation to figure out the actors that are doing it and how, the, because of encryption, how they obfuscate themselves, how they anonymize themselves, it's a long time to do it. Where, as we've seen, uh, the examples of the influence, how quickly, it can, in, uh, how quickly it can influence an election, a business, or how quickly it can act, the damage can be done so fast these days. That we do need legislation, probably that's, I think that's across the board. Most countries are behind on legislation involving any cyber matters because it is a new technology and the technology clearly outpaces our legislation, but it takes us a long time to develop legislation and enforcing that sometimes does not prevent the malign act or the malign influence. And your job is working with legats. Yes. And so you work with, you direct actually the legats around the world in 90, how no, 90 yes. co countries. And so in, in a sense, you, you, your job entails having a sense of what international governance there is, international cooperation. Let's talk about the international cooperation a little bit. How, how is that? Are, is there a sense of shared standards? Is there a sense of um, identifying a malign actor? Um, oh, I, can, I can use the example of Estonia. They're a great partner to the FBI. Share, we share a lot of information. We're great partners. We work well together. Um, and we all try and share information. If we do have threat information or new training tactics procedures of our malign actors and cyber as quickly as you can. But even with that, we are still always behind the, the, the ball. The, the, the malign actors are adapting. And I, know, I did hear uh, my gentleman, the gentleman from Sweden talk about how his systems are hardened from an attack. Well, no systems are completely safe from an attack. Municipal doesn't matter. Every system is vulnerable. It's just a question of if the vulnerability gets, uh, gets found. There's zero, they're creating custom zero-day exploits every day for specific systems set up in a specific way to do, it, to do a, a cyber attack. So we can all do the best we can to share information and to harden all of our systems together. That's why it's so important. But we can't catch it all. And that's where the legislation comes into effect. That's where 
as, uh, as we're saying in Estonia, we need to get private partners involved, we need to get the public involved, we need to mobilize them to, to try and build a resiliency against this malign influence and say, well, everything you see on the internet is not necessarily true, everything you see on the web is not necessarily true, and try and question that. So it's a, it, it is a concerted effort. Uh, we do the best working with our partners and international covenants and agreements to help them defend themselves because any attack on any of our partners is an attack on us. Michael, do you want to respond? Yeah, well, legislation of what? Uh, because I think everyone sees in their head now we should legislate against disinformation from other countries. Well, what if this country doesn't care about our legislation? And, and, I, and I agree with you that we have yeah. The Russians don't care about the legislation anyone else in this country, and you do no. the Chinese, so. No, the, the field people who get stuck in the U.S. now uh, be, being sued, uh, they might care. But the top bosses, the ones directing this, they don't care. Legislation is also, unfortunately, a very slow process. And this is a very rapidly movement, moving uh, environment with new tactics. And uh, I would argue that uh, Election interference is so 2016, 2017. The interesting question here is, what are they going to do now? And, right. and the problem here, talking about disinformation, it's just one small part of the aggressor's toolbox. You have diplomacy, economy, uh, fuel, uh, lawfare in itself, uh, uh, and uh, the military. There are so many tools. And they, what they do is they look at your country and see, Okay, what's their vulnerability? And then they're going to use that. So, uh, so and, and that's why it's, for me, it's so important to talk about that you have to have a situational awareness, understand the threat, and actually also understand the vulnerabilities in the threat when it comes to disinformation. They have a problem here. They are using information to deceive us, with, and they have a malign intent against our country. But they're targeting our population and our decision makers. So if our population and decision makers are aware, then uh, it is much tougher. Then they will have to use another tool, and which will be something else. So Jason, this is something you've given a lot of thought to, which is public awareness, sort of bringing in, you and I have talked about um, you know, one of my pet peeves, which is there's the public sector, there's the private sector, they're always saying the public and private should work together. And I'm not sure where the citizens and the consumers fit into that. Yeah. So you've given some thought to this. Can you talk a little bit about public awareness? So I, th I think there are kind of three buckets in which you can think about trying to explore options to counter disinformation. I, I think one is a legislative bucket. And I, I agree, I'm fairly um, non-optimistic about that, that particular bucket. If you go to congress.gov and see how many bills Congress has introduced with the key term disinformation, you'll find that there have been 30 bills, 20 of which are looking retrospectively at the 2016 ele election and thinking about sort of the Russian disinformation campaign in that space. Um, so I, I am also of the mind that, you know, over the course of the two days, we talked a lot about disinformation, disinformation by state. So in a lot of ways, thinking about legislation in this space is allowing the fox in the hen house. And I, I think um, in, in some ways we need to get past that. And that's where I think, yes, we have to talk about education. And I heard a lot about education, which is really reassuring to, to, to see over the course of these two days about the importance of educating consumers, um, the importance of getting out of our ivy towers if we're academics or if we're experts to get out there and engage with people at the middle school and high school level. And at the Middlebury Institute where I work, we have a program called MISTI. Um, the Middlebury Institute's full name is the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. That's the MISP part. And there's a school called the Stevenson School in the uh, Monterey Peninsula area called Stevenson. It's misty. And if you think about this information, we're, we're talking about sort of the, the fog of that disinformation. But we need to train these people because these are the people in the future who are actually going to make a difference with the companies. And I think a really good analogy in this space is when an organization called Cloudflare um, made a decision to no longer work with an organization called 8chan. Um, essentially, um, Cloudflare was providing internet service, provide, pr uh, providing services to Cloudflare, uh, to 8chan, which is this hate board in which white supremacists are propagating their message. Um, 
the public spoke out about that. Cloudflare saw that this is going to hurt our bottom line if we continue to provide these services to 8chan. It was because of the public's appeal, because of the consumer's appeal that this company took action against 8chan. And it wasn't until a couple weeks after that that Congress actually invited the owner of 8chan, um, Jim Watkins, to provide testimony about why 8chan is this form in which um, disinformation about white supremacy ideals can proliferate. So in, in that sense, I think educating the consumer and then leveraging things like your influence as a consumer and civil society solutions are the, the best path forward. The one thing I'll say about legislation where I think um, today is instructive um, is in the AI space, it's really hard, for instance, for AI researchers to work in the United States um, permanently or even for a temporary period of time. Um, the H-1B visa program doesn't work. The United States has something called a P-1 visa program that allows professional athletes and their um, hanger-ons, including masseuses, um, their therapists, to come in for a prolonged period of time, but you don't have that flexibility to bring in AI researchers um, to the United States or any other countries to be able to essentially diversify the workplace to deal with issues like deep fakes, to deal with issues like language models. And this is where Congress, and should focus its energy to essentially expand the horizons by essentially in engaging um, with um, the private sector to allow for smarter people to come in and be part of these organizations who are trying to figure out this very diverse threat, the diverse threat posed by AI in the disinformation space. And there's a really good paper I want to recommend that a group called Partnership on AI did about this issue. Um, because I think it's a diverse issue and you're going to need a diverse array of talent to be able to do this. And the last point I would make on this in terms of legislation is legislation is so restrictive that it's really hard to have a conference like this if this was an AI conference in the United States because of all the paperwork people have to go through to get into the U.S. Um, and that's why it's really good that we have a conference like this in Qatar. It's a visa-free country for 80 plus countries. And in that, in that reason, I think it's important to think about legislation um, in that context to bring in the right people at the right time. Karen, the FBI doesn't do immigration. I'm just putting it out there for you. <laughs> I was going to ask. You know that. Thank you. For <laughs> um, Kate, you've talked a lot about public awareness, right? So are, have you been able, in your sense, to um, to what extent have you been able to educate your population to think about disinformation? What are the best tools that you found for doing that? How has that affected the threat environment over this last decade and a half that you've been dealing with this problem directly? In Estonian case, um, I still remember from my childhood when everything we saw in TV, uh, we had to put a huge question mark on it because it, um, a lot of it came from the Moscow. It was uh, still the Soviet uh, time. So the natural skepticism um, or the natural um, uh, questioning of the uh, source um, is still very much there. Um, Will it still be there in 20 years uh, when we have the generation that does not have the um, similar um, memories from the Soviet time? We are certainly working with it so that, um, um, again, um, an important uh, lesson uh, for us has been that, um, um, yes, we do educate um, already uh, young generation uh, and also the education of the civil servants, um, uh, also the media um, education, they organize uh, for themselves, it's there. And um, uh, what we have avoided is to organize all that uh, by the government. Um, even in countries like Estonia, there happens to be some uh, skepticism against uh, government every now and then. Uh, so that um, uh, we see that it's best uh, done from uh, or by a completely um, independent body. Uh, also, uh, when it comes to the uh, election um, uh, or pre preparations for the elections, uh, we do have uh, an independent uh, office or an independent committee uh, that starts their work a few years before the elections um, and that also work um, in monitoring the social media and, and the media um, platforms. Um, again, I would underline once more it's an independent body. 
So uh, this is uh, why I had what, what I had in mind when I said that uh, our lesson is that we have to engage the whole society, not just the government. And a lot of um, what uh, is connected with the disinformation is more effectively more effectively done uh, by the um, um, by the bodies, by the organizations, by the uh, uh, business sector that is not connected uh, directly with the government. But so, but still, uh, I would I would still say that uh, I, all this uh, awareness raising is certainly extremely important. But again. Where it all starts from is the political will and the political awareness uh, in realizing that it might be a problem and uh, it has to be uh, dealt with. Uh, without it, it would be extremely, extremely difficult to, uh, to succeed. So Michael, in thinking about the challenges that lie ahead, now that we, you've told us that 2016 is old news, which I'm so happy to know that, um, that that moving ahead, um, one of the things that Jason talked about was um, talent, expertise, how you bring it in. And one of the things I'm wondering about, um, and you can all address it, and this will, um, I think this will affect the future of it, is um, the sort of training for the disinformation space and how we teach not just our youth in schools, but our experts and our professionals, because you've said this is a, um, you know, profession-wide, you know, we need a whole society of coaches, you've both said. Um, and so what is the challenge in terms of the, the young professional generation that's finding its way into politics, that's finding its way into the tech sector, that's what, what, is, what is the challenge in that, that part of it? And I know you, have, you must have an answer for that. Of course. <laughs> no, uh, it was a very big question, and I was not really prepared for it. I don't know why. But uh, the, the thing here is, uh, since I'm, I'm pounding there the, the idea of awareness, it's important. And, and, and we did a program here. We trained 13,000 civil servants in awareness of the threat. And then we set up a training for uh, how to counter and put out a handbook. But we didn't target the same civil servants. We actually targeted uh, communicators uh, working in official organizations, uh, and, uh, but we handed it out so anyone could use it because we realized that a, a, a safe and secure community is a community that communicates. So you actually need to figure out what are the information nodes in your society? Don't build a new system just because there's this, this information. Look at your society, how it works, and, and uh, uh, create resilience and robustness there. So that was our idea. And now we're actually go doing the same thing together with, an, uh, with the university, uh, creating a handbook for journalists. Because they are, how should I say, the mirror of our society. They are the mass communicators. And at the same time, free press is living its own life. So the government isn't there. So we're giving them money, they're doing it themse <coughs> Sorry, themselves. And I think that's one way of going now through the society. And, and another thing we've decided to do is actually to create resilience, and it's not coming from us, the ideas. We finance research. And we want different universities in Sweden hopefully all, to have their own perspective on this. Because if they uh, research the, these issues, uh, then it will proliferate into all training, education, and areas within the academic, which means it will also reach the schools uh, and our youth, uh, and so on. Because one of the problems here, why, as I said before, influencing, information influence works because we're vulnerable. But I would argue that we don't understand the information environment where we live in. So, so that would be one idea. Th that's how we are working with this, anyway. Um, turning to you, Charles. In terms of just the awareness of the society at large, 
Do you feel that there's, um, or the people you work with feel that there's a gap in awareness in the United States in terms of understanding their own vulnerability to, you know, their lack of being skeptical on the internet? Or do you feel that uh, that's something that's growing apace with the threat? How do you? I guess I'll go with a, a famous Mark Twain quote, you get your facts first, then you can distort them as you please. Um, so uh, in general, uh, I think we, we do have an issue with it and communicating in the United States, communicating that message of being aware of malign influence is, is a significant issue because we're a very large country, we're very diverse, with very div uh, diverse communities uh, living there and it creates a problem of how do you message it to different groups, so that's that's one problem of it. And this, the skip, to make them skeptical of it, the problem is is today, I think we see the drop in you know newspapers going out of business. We see the drop in you know viewership of established media. They believe it because their entire life, if you just go walking down the street, you see someone living their life on their phone, and they want to believe on their phone. And there's a you know as I, I, and I hate the overused term of AI, but when we make advances of computers when we get you know better deep thinking computers that have better basically better uh, better better programs to run to mimic human behavior that are going to have massive data sets available to them whether they're available legitimately or have been stolen they're going to analyze what people are doing what they're looking at and the malign influence will be directed individually at groups on specific websites and then you're going to run into the cognitive bias of hey this is supporting my my views my theory and it is very hard to, to, take, to tell someone that what they're looking at is wrong, especially if they have others telling them that they are right. It's just human nature. So it is, a, it is an uphill climb with a 120, pound, 120 pounds of gear on your back climbing up, up a hill to, to, to change that, to cha to change that, that, uh, that, I guess, that appetite for the information right now. And it doesn't matter if it's wrong. Everyone just wants to be first and get that information and spread it. So the answer is, is it a very difficult task, and I don't know if we'll be able to accomplish it. We're going to try, though. No, you have to say you're going to accomplish it. Yes. You, got, okay. uh, one other thing that has, um, I think, helped uh, Estonia is that uh, we are extremely open with all the attempts uh, that uh, we can put our finger on and say that uh, now there were, were attempts to influence, whether it's online or offline. And uh, we do also have um, our um, um, in intelligence services uh, publishing their yearbooks uh, yearly, and it, it's very detailed, I can say. Um, once uh, all the attempts are made uh, public, they are discussed quite often, you know, taken into bits. Um, and this has also definitely helped to increase the understanding what is going on online, how they are doing it, and uh, how um, every uh, individual person should respond. respond. Um, also, uh, how to be critical, what does it mean to be critical uh, online? And uh, the question that sometimes, especially elderly people, even ask me is that whom should I call? If I uh, see um, in Facebook, which is mainly a channel for older people uh, now for in Estonia, that something probably is uh, uh, is wrong, or if I suddenly, you know, get hundreds of friends requests from a nice-looking uniformed uh, gentleman, uh, which uh, you know, uh, for my own aunt or mother might not be, you know, very um, natural thing, uh, whom should I turn to? And uh, I think now it's uh, the awareness what to do is definitely uh, quite high in Estonia, especially because all those cases have been um, uh, made public and, uh, and they have analyzed in really deep details. That's interesting um, that, you know, making aware of the vulnerabilities afterwards sort of contributes. That's, that's a, an important path, I think, lessons learned. Um, Jason, um, do you feel that th the same sense of the sort of um, burden of climbing uphill that Charles just described and sort of this task that's going to be, you know, how do we educate and protect and keep aware and keep ahead of the new uh, threats that are coming? You too, in your slide, um, slides, talked about the, you know, massive nature of the threat. Um, how much is possible um, do, you, do you feel? I, I, I agree it's a, it's a huge challenge and, and one of the things I think 
everybody that's in academia can do, like I mentioned before, is, is step outside that ivory tower. And what we're trying to do as we step outside the ivory tower is try to educate people at the middle school and, and high school level about digital identity um, in an effort to um, have these young people understand that when you post something on social media, it's likely to be something that can live there forever. So I think we need to increase that, that literacy um, how their own digital identity will be looked at, but also to increase their literacy to understand other people's digital identity. Um, I, I think we can't start too early in terms of trying to educate young people also about online extremism more generally, the who, what, when, where, how online radicalization occurs, and for what purpose, what's the big picture. Um, in terms of social media, you, you see uh, amongst uh, white supremacist groups this, this idea of red pilling, which comes from the movie The Matrix, where essentially I'm going to try to enlighten people um, at a younger le level or age um, by telling them the truth and trying to redirect them to perhaps another site that can expose them to so-called the truth, the truth from the perspective of that online radicalizer. And I think a lot of people, when they first make their forays into social media, may be a little um, naive about this. Um, they, they may be um, susceptible to those messages. So it's incumbent upon um, educators to go out and to increase digital and media literacy, first and foremost. That will fail, though, unless companies take more corporate responsibility and think about their obligations in a social and ethical sense, particularly as it relates to the release of artificial intelligence tools to the wider public. Now, it's great that Facebook, for instance, is putting out $10 million requests for somebody to help solve the deep fake challenge, and that's interesting. But at the same time, Facebook, and Facebook has been really beaten up here um, over the course of the two days, but for good reason, is making a decision not to pull political ads that they know to be um, false, and I think that's problematic. So m my position has been, with that consumer um, you know, being educated, they're able to put more pressure, levy more pressure on the corporate entities because they're in this position where they're not going to change their, their position unless there's some kind of reputational risk or financial risk to them. I also believe companies should adopt something from the government from my 20 years of service that I thought was really useful. There is an intelligence community directive called Intelligence Community Directive 403. And whenever the United States government was thinking about releasing information to the general public, declassifying it or downgrading it, um, the U.S. government came together and thought about what are the consequences of that. Um, this is an internal review process that I think in many, in many companies just doesn't simply exist. Let's get that new gadget out there and make some money. But there needs to be these internal review controls before this um, new technology is disseminated. And this is where I have some hope. Um, I mentioned early in the slides that we were working with OpenAI, and OpenAI has developed GPT-2, um, something that they call the GPT-2 language model. It's 1.5 billion parameter, which means essentially it has ingested a lot of information. They spent a lot of information on it so it can create synthetic text that looks authentic. And they thought, like, maybe we should talk to some academics about this before we release it. And I think that's an example of social and ethical responsibility that bigger companies like Facebook ought to adopt. I'll pile on the uh, corporate responsibility bandwagon a little bit. Um, I think we have set it up so these technological giants in many countries now are forming social policy basically by their business practice and their business models. I think one of the big fights that the FBI has led and several other countries have taken on with us is lawful access to devices. Um, you know, this whole blanket protection of encryption on everything, and Facebook's talking about going end-to-end -end encryption, that even the end-using company doesn't have the encryption key to get into, creates a significant problem, because when you need lawful access for criminal acts, terrorist acts, or for all kinds of other things through lawful ju ju judicial process, we cannot get it. And is really... Uh, creating significant issues in criminal investigations, especially with child pornography investigations, human trafficking, terrorism, all kinds of other investigations. And it is hiding behind the corporate shield of, well, this is what our consumers want, and we're going to give it to them because we can make more money, even though it's not the right thing. Now, we're hoping legislation comes forward. We're working on that legislatively to try and work on that in the United States. Several countries, such as Australia, have already taken it to task, and other countries around the world are, because, you know, Everyone has a right to privacy until the citizens of that country decide that their right, that the, the rights of the citizens of the country override your right to individual privacy. So that, I'll pile on that corporate bandwagon bashing. Michael, I want to uh, turn to you to talk a little bit about resiliency. 
which you mentioned before. And so um, in terms of defense, in terms of, and a lot of the leading cyber, cyber experts in the country now, in, in the United States now, talk about the importance of defense in a way they didn't in the past, which is that, you know, build a defense system that can't be, you know, penetrated and it'll go away as a problem. Now I know this is kind of um, hopeful, but in terms of disinformation, um, how do you assess um, the role of defense and how effective it can be in terms of creating a resilient environment? Well, uh, I would say that all our activities so far from Sweden and what I've explained here is defensive. Uh, so it is about creating resilience and robustness and uh, knowing your vulnerabilities uh, before the aggressor do it and thereby uh, actually highlighting that we're not vulnerable anymore so they won't do it because they're opportunistic and they and when we look at some major state actors we see that in their system they are economically motivated they are uh, using vectors c as companies or corruption or things like that it, it has to be a payoff to get get it done so, so but what we also realized is that that is not enough um, uh, to, to go in also to what Kate said before here, uh, taking a step back is a lost step. For instance, if you would be working against the Russians, if you would be under attack from them, because they, they and, and that is the, the thing, that you have to stand firmly on the ground. But also communicating uh, and uh, addressing the issues in a way that it hurts them. I think the UK did a tremendous job uh, during the Skripal Salisbury, where they, instead of going down for the nitty gritty, as we call pig wrestling, you know, uh, uh, with, with some, some fake facts or fake news, instead talking about the system and uh, proactively saying, and now the Russians will do this and they will do that. And also getting uh, together all the European countries uh, and doing, putting diplomatic pressure and here, uh, defense and, uh, and deterrence doesn't have to be on the information arena just because we're being attacked there. We need to think influence campaign. So what are their vulnerabilities, the aggressors' vulnerabilities? What will hurt them? What can a small country do to fight back? Um, and would you distinguish between economic threat and political threat, or do you see them signed of on, on a sort of continuum where you're having the same uh, questions asked going back? Does it matter what, it, what the motivation is? It's, it's, it's all together now. Yeah. You can't differ from them. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, we have time for final thoughts, and um, I'm going to start with you, Charles. And when I, what I want you to really do is make everybody go home more hopeful because this has been a really scary two days. And <laughs> that's the problem with the last panel, but it's also the challenge. And so where are we? I mean, we're not where we were three years ago or four years ago. We've made great strides largely because of attacks um, and attempts to attack. But where, where are we? And where do you see us in the trajectory of from being threatened and vulnerable to being um, secure in a way that we feel that we've responded to our citizens? Uh, I think we are more secure now than we were, and I think one of the reasons we are is because of partnerships and forums like this, uh, sharing the information and sharing of intelligence on these malign threats, these malign actors, is our number one job that I do in the FBI International Operations Division, and Director Ray, my director, has said he wants to be the FBI to be the best partner in all of our nations because of that. It makes us stronger, and we we need to all learn from each other as fast as we can and pass that information. I think it is hopeful because I see, compared to my time, how much, how fast information sharing is between nations that are partners now compared to what it used to, and that makes us all stronger. And I think there is more of a public knowledge and a public appetite now. The United States is waking up a little bit on the malign influence, not like Estonia, that's a veteran of it. But I think we're waking up and we're learning on it, and hopefully we can develop that resiliency uh, as a country to. Uh, to make it better. So I am hopeful. Okay. So am I, definitely. Um, and I think that uh, all those uh, useful tips we got from the forum, uh, at least in, in, in Estonian case, definitely very useful. 
if I can just pick few um, and describe the roadmap uh, that I will take home with me is that uh, when it comes to the disinformation, the first thing is still to prevent, to be, uh, to think about how to uh, uh, prevent it happening. Uh, also, um, that means raising the, still raising the awareness, um, but also exercising. Um, I think it's never enough to exercise on cases like, like that. And this is again something that we do also on political level, on government level, but also uh, in, uh, in uh, free media, for example to be ready uh, once it happens. So prevent, uh, second uh, step, if you have not been able to prevent it and um, uh, you will find yourself under the attack, uh, first um, be ready to respond. Still, I would highlight that. Um, and um, be ready to respond also uh, on international level. Um, I will come back to what I said in the beginning. I think that it is crucial because uh, uh, separate countries on themselves can be, uh, especially if under attack, rather uh, weak. And uh, the final point still for me is to go public as much as you can. Uh, uh, even if you know um, some, or if you will find some of the vulnerabilities, still uh, if you go public and be very open about it, it becomes your strength. Michael? Well, in general, we're going in the right direction. Uh, awareness and cooperation is increasing internationally and nationally. And we can even see within the tech industry and social media that they are actually addressing this in a different way. Two years ago, it looked very different. So, uh, so therefore, yes, it looks good to some extent. So one of the issues that we haven't addressed enough is actually the reason why we're vulnerable, and that is the trust between uh, the individual, the, the citizens, and the government, and the system. And as long as we don't address that properly, uh, we, we will be vulnerable. So good and bad. Jason? I tend to be a pretty pessimistic person in nature, so I'll, I'll try to right the, the best I, I, I can here. I, um, now that I have almost the, the last word on the last panel on the last day, um, I, I'll say, um, from my perspective, the fact that there is a meeting like this is it gives me reason for hope. Um, the one thing I, I would just caution is um, I, there is this phrase somebody pretty famous in the United States used um, became viral, and it's this idea of alternative facts. And I, I, I'll just want to end with this: if if alternative facts become a synonym for disinformation, then we're losing the battle against disinformation because that somehow implies alternative facts that those facts may be accurate when they're truly inaccurate. So in that sense, I think it's going to be incumbent upon educators, um, non-governmental individuals and corporate corporations to work together to try to solve the challenge of disinformation. And I, I do have some hope because of meetings like this that we can get there. So see, it's a hopeful note at the end of the conference. Let me just kind of sum up a little bit. Um, it's interesting, the kind of symmetry in this panel, because Charles started with a thread that you continued with, and Michael, you just pulled it up at the end, which is the essential issue of trust between citizens and their government, and also the essential issue of trust between individuals in one country, whether it's government or non-government, and individuals in another country. And so I think one of the, the great things about the topic of disinformation is it gets at some very truly human issues about how we trust one another, how we deal with another, and how we move forward with better tools. So on that note, uh, I want to thank you for joining this panel, and thank you for coming to the conference, and there will be closing remarks, and then we can have dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy my panel.